Thank you for joining us today. It's uh, Eric Watchman here, and we have Sandy and uh, Jeevan. So we'll leave uh, a minute or so just for everybody to be able to uh, to connect. I see the numbers are starting to pop up, which is wonderful. So, uh, just a second, we'll get started. Uh, as everybody uh, starts logging in, just want to take one moment to wish a very happy birthday to uh, Mr. Kennedy uh, under here. So thank you, Sandy, for joining us on this birthday. And uh, we, we couldn't think of a better way to spend your 65th or is it 66th birthday with you. So thank you. <laughs> now, now. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you. Perfect. So we'll just leave. Uh, let me see. So we have a good amount of attendees that are coming in. We'll leave a few minutes. As uh, the numbers are starting to get in, I just want to introduce everybody. So I'm Eric Watchman. I'm part of the WWM team at uh, CI Asante Wealth Management and happy to present uh, Sandy Kennedy and Jeevan Sangara today and really to go through all things uh, first time home buying, uh, regardless of where you are on the spectrum. If you've started to look at homes, uh, if you're thinking about it, if you've had a discussion with your spouse or your wife and you guys are thinking, now oh, you know what, it's let's, we want to take the next step. Uh, you're in the right place. We're going to go through the whole spectrum of start to finish. Uh, and, and delve into tips uh, for each of these steps. Uh, so really want to make it an, an actionable and an interactive webinar. So we'll have questions throughout. Uh, so we're going to run through those five steps of, for success. Then we'll also get a bonus. Uh, birthday Man Sandy is going to take us through his 10 uh, tips for, uh, for buyers, which is wonderful. And then we'll have a Q&A segment. But that being said, we'll have Q&As throughout. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I want to introduce our speaker. So Sandy, if you uh, just want to say hello and introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Sandy Kennedy. I'm a real estate sales representative for 3 Max here in the Toronto area. I look forward to answering your questions and hopefully giving you some insight today into the buying process. Hey everybody, I'm Jeevan Sangara. I'm the principal broker here at Circle Mortgage Group. Uh, we have offices in Burlington, Oakville, Mississauga, and Toronto. Uh, basically serve all of Canada, but I really look forward to answering your questions today. And uh, I'm very excited to share the stage with Sandy. I, I've had the opportunity once before and to say the man knows his, uh, his way around real estate would be a severe understatement. So I'm looking uh, forward to it myself. Wonderful. Thanks, Stephen and Sandy. So we've got, I mean, pretty remarkable to have so much wisdom uh, in this virtual screen. So uh, thanks again to you both. And it looks like everybody's settled in. So I hope you have your lunch or something and uh, you're, uh, you're ready to get started. So uh, last note of housekeeping, uh, I'm assuming everybody can see the screen. If you can't, just put a note in the chat, but I think everything should be working as is. If you do have a question at any point, you can use the chat function that is uh, below, and uh, Leah and I will be monitoring that, and uh, throughout we'll be bringing up questions. So don't you don't have to wait till the Q&A segment. If you have a question, please ask, and uh, we'll look to get to it in due time. Uh, you're all muted, so if you scream, if your dog barks, we won't hear you. Uh, so uh, just be mindful of that uh, or use that as, as you may. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to get started now. So let's, uh, let's move on. Okay, so first thing, we're going to look at the five steps to success. And I'll lead this and I'll have uh, Jeevan and Sandy uh, add their, their insights and wisdom throughout. Uh, after we'll move to a quick Q&A segment, if there are any burning questions, then Sandy will take us through his 10 tips and then we'll do a wrap up. So again, if there are questions at any point, uh, we want you to, uh, to ask and uh, this, is, this is the whole purpose. Uh, so please feel free. So let's get started. All right, so step number one. So regardless of where you are, if you're just starting to think about, uh, if you've already started looking on MLS, it really the first step, Putting all that aside, first thing you want to do is make sure you have your financial ducks in order. And a few reasons why, but really you want to be able to answer three main questions. So before you even get started, before you look, oh, do I want a house with a backyard, a hot tub, a sauna? Do your homework first and make sure you list these three questions out. So one, how much do you have saved? So, and if you're a first time home buyer thinking about this, uh, it would be good for you to, to start jotting these down because if you're serious about buying a home and uh, generally if you're here, you are, uh, you want to be able to answer these questions and make sure you do your homework before you get into the buying process, which we'll get to, uh, but very important to do your homework. So one, how much do you have saved? How much do you need? And can you afford it? So three very fundamental questions. I'll, I'll break these down uh, so you have a better understanding of where we're coming from. But the first one is listing how much you have saved. If 
few things that you want to keep in mind and important tips. So you might have built up savings through a multitude of different accounts. You might have your TFSA topped if you're saving efficiently. Uh, you might have put money in an RRSP if uh, you have maybe a group matching plan through work or you've done some planning. And you might also have money in a non-registered savings account or sprinkled uh, another trading account elsewhere. So really the first thing you want to do, take an inventory, see where your money is, see where it's located and see what it's invested in. So a few things that you want to keep in mind. So one, if you have money that is in a non-registered account, for example, you're a savings account or a trading account, that's not a TFSA or RSP. You want to be mindful that there might be capital gains in that account. So meaning you see 80,000 uh, on your, your statement, you say, oh, wonderful, I've got 80 grand, but you put in 40 and it's grew exponentially. So you have $40,000 in taxes, you're going to have a significant tax bill come tax time. So you want to know one, not just the figure on paper, but what figure you actually have or the net amount. Now, if that's the case, you might have a strategy to put some money in your RSP to, to uh, dim, diminish that tax bill, but you wanna be mindful of that full picture. We can help with that, but first step is listing those assets and getting a better understanding of those obligations. So that's on the RSP, yeah, the non-registered savings front. On the RRSP side of things, uh, many of you might be familiar with the first time home buyers plan. How it works is you can withdraw up to 35,000 if you've had money in your RSP for at least 89 days, essentially three months. So you check back from the period of withdrawal, three months, what was the amount that you had in there? You can withdraw up to that amount. And the way it works is it's essentially you're borrowing from yourself. So you don't have any tax or no withholding tax on that amount. So you can take the whole amount out of uh, up to 35 out of your RSP, get that in your bank account in three to five days if you're in mutual funds, say, and you don't have to start paying that back until uh, two years. And the way it works is you have to pay that back over 15 years. So you essentially take out uh, say 35,000 divided by 15 years, two years after the withdrawal, you have a choice to pay one fifteenth of that back every year, or you can have it added to your income. So that's essentially how that whole strain of the RSP withdrawal works. Um, a few minor qualifications, your spouse can't uh, have had a property. So if you had a spouse that uh, for some had a condo and investment property, you might not qualify. So that's the only wrinkle, but otherwise, uh, a great plan that you started saving your RSP allows you to one, reduce your taxes and also take a bit of that uh, to use for your down payment. So those are the two main points on that front. And, and just another reminder that um, generally, if you want to withdraw funds from your TFSA, from your RSP, it takes about three to five days if you're invested in mutual funds from the money to get to, to your account. So just those are the big, big rules of thumb to keep in mind. So. I will pause on that and I will go to number two. So at any point, uh, I have the question and the chat open. So I'll be monitoring uh, throughout. I'll just take a pause here. Make sure everybody's good. Okay, and then Sandy and, and Jeevan, feel free to jump in at any time uh, or we can also uh, address it, your section. So this one, uh, how much do you need? So number one is making sure you list out what you have. Uh, net worth, I mean, uh, looking at the actual value, but also looking to see if there are any tax implications. And then step two, once you've done that, is determining how much you need to get in the market. So you know what you have, and now it's a question of how much you need. So we'll get into this. The first uh, is um, not, not a questionable, but uh, the 5 to 20% down payment amount is something that we'll, we'll touch upon with Jeevan. Uh, if you ask Jeevan, you say, all you need is 5%. Uh, if you ask the planner, I'll say plan for 20% and then work your way back. So we'll, we'll touch upon that. But as a planner and, and, and also in life, I mean, the, the name of the game is make is giving yourself options. So if you plan for 20%, then you have the option of going down to five. So as, as I like to recommend to clients, plan for about 20% and then you can always work backwards. Um, that way you're not scrounging. But a good rule of thumb, uh, say start with 20% as your plan uh, for down payment. There are options. Uh, but that's a good rule of thumb to see how much you need. So if you do pay above, I think it's 10%, well, uh, sorry, less than 20% down, you do have to pay mortgage default insurance. That being said, many of the times it's it's worth uh, doing the amount that you pay in default insurance is, is minor uh, and the, the gains on the property itself will more than recoup that as long as you can you have the cash flow to afford that. So uh, Jim can touch upon that uh, later if there's anything else to add, but that is just another piece in, in keeping in mind as to what the cash flow looks like. Now, the other thing you want to remember is yes, there's a big price tag associated with buying a home, 
Uh, but there's all these other price tags that are also associated that need to be factored in uh, because when you're doing a transaction of this size, uh, which might for, for a lot of people might be the biggest transaction they ever do and committing, uh, I guess, other than marriage, where you are committing for, for, uh, for, for life. This is a 30, 25 year commitment that you're making. So for individuals that might be 20, 25, you're committing for a longer period than you've lived, which is uh, pretty remarkable. So you want to make sure that you know the ins and outs. Uh, you do your homework and then you get to that. So part of doing that homework is understanding that one, there are other costs. So land transfer tax, closing costs, home inspection, home appraisal, and then a buffer for unforeseen expenses, which I might argue is almost the most important one. Make sure you have uh, a nice amount set aside or, or something to tap into when uh, things do go wrong and not to say they will, but uh, there's always gonna be a few twists and turns uh, as this happens. So land transfer tax, we'll, we'll get to those amounts. There are a few rebates that uh, you might qualify for as a first time home buyer. And uh, we'll look at that. In terms of closing costs, that's mostly with regards to paying uh, the, uh, the lawyer who's gonna be helping with that. So, I mean, depending on the amount that could range for one to $5,000. So uh, you wanna get just an estimate of that with, uh, with the professional you're working with. Home inspection, this will likely be something that we're, we'll talk, we'll touch upon with Sandy, uh, seeing as are, are these conditions that are even included in, in offers these days, uh, given the state of the market. So we'll touch upon that because the old dogma goes, uh, every time you're buying, you want to make sure you have a home inspection, but in today's reality, uh, that might not even get you in the, in the door. So we'll touch upon that. Home appraisal, uh, same thing, uh, mostly on the bank side, but that usually goes to $500 or on the, the brokerage side, uh, that might be rolled in smaller amount, but then the buffer for unforeseen expenses, 10 to, 10 to 15 or five to 15 uh, in accessible cash is a good rule of thumb. Uh, you have to buy out a hot water tank. You have to fix a, a roof. There are all these things that do happen. So you want to make sure you're, you're not blowing uh, and that you're, you're left thin. So those are just a few of the costs that you want to list out and have a, a reasonable estimate as you're looking to, to price this all out. The next chart, we're going to look at the credits and the programs available. So I will get on that. And I want to mention one more thing is we're going to be uh, off. We're going to be sending out a summary for, uh, for all of these, basically for our five tips. And we'll also have uh, handy links. So that'll come out to you after the fact. So uh, keep an eye out for that. You don't have to remember all of these amounts, but uh, high level. Uh, so I just want to see, we do have this here. Okay. So a few of the programs and credits that I uh, wanted to touch upon. So for first time home buyers, there is a tax credit. It's a $5,000 non-refundable credit. doesn't mean you get $5,000 back from the government. That would be very nice. You get uh, up to 750 back in tax relief. So it's a tax credit, meaning that if you owe a certain amount, then you deduct that uh, from your taxes owing and you get 750 less in taxes to pay essentially. So if you don't owe any tax, you won't be able to claim this, uh, but likely you will owe some amount of tax and you will be able to uh, at least get a small amount back from the government. Thank you very much. The other one that is uh, most more appealing in a sense is a land transfer tax refund for first time home buyers. And this can be up to $4,000 uh, for Ontario, excluding Toronto, and then up to 84, 75. I think those are the actual, the actual figures, Sandy or Jimmy, let me know if uh, they've been updated. But uh, so you, you do have to pay, I mean, Sandy, uh, for, uh, for say a million dollar house in, in Toronto, what, what would be the, the rough land transfer tax that uh, clients would have to pay roughly, just for to give an example? Uh, well, that's a good question. I'm, uh, it's a floating scale. Jeevan, maybe you have a close by, but I would say it's up in the range of 40 or $50,000, maybe slightly higher. Uh, in Peel, uh, uh, which is where I do a lot of my work, at, at the land transfer tax is actually half of what it is in Toronto. Jeevan, you, you have the, uh, the table. I have to unmute to be able to do that. Uh, yeah, so on a million dollar purchase outside of Toronto proper, you would be at $16,000, uh, just over 16475 That's just the provincial land transfer tax. If you move to Toronto, uh, Jeevan? Well, wait a second. <laughs> He's in deep thought. Then it goes up. Oh, no, I'm speaking. Uh, uh, I love the internet. <laughs> I love well, the internet. We moved to Toronto, so I think you're saying uh, yeah, so, 
I, I'm sorry. If you were in Toronto, you're looking at $32,950 on a million dollar purchase. Um, outside of the GTA, you can basically have that number uh, to about $16,000. Um, that's on a million flat. Uh, if, you know, I, I'm sure Sandy shares it. Um, the land transfer tax calculations in Ontario haven't been changed since the 90s. So to say that they're no longer reflective of market value uh, would have a, be a severe understatement. But I'll, I'll let you continue with, uh, with what you're doing here. Good. So that's just a show. I mean, that, that's significant. So if you're just thinking of, oh, I, well, we can afford a, afford a $800,000 home, there's a significant price tag associated with these other factors. So yes, you'd get a credit, say Toronto, up to 8000 but you're, you owe thirty two. So that leaves it with, uh, with I mean, 20, 24 that you, you have to pay out of pocket. And that is in addition to the, the housing costs. So uh, when we're talking about holistic, know what you're buying, this figures into that. So a high level, you want to make sure that you know the levers and uh, how much you could be responsible for. So uh, thanks for that. that. That helps drive that home point, point home. Uh, lastly, I mean, there's a, if you're buying a new house, there might be a GST and HST rebate. Uh, there's uh, more details on the link there. Uh, that might apply if, if you're looking at a new build. I, uh, likely the, the developer might uh, might also share that with you, but if not, uh, good to know that that's available. The first-time homebuyers plan we we discussed. And now there's also a new uh, revamped first-time homebuyer incentive uh, that's just been released or reworked. So that's up to 5 to 10% of a shared equity mortgage towards a down payment. Uh, Ajib, I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to add uh, to that one. I'm not sure if you've used it with a few clients, but if there is a uh, good point to share. Sure. Um, so the way they altered the program is, is that for major cities, so when this program first came out, it basically had zero utilization. And what I mean is, is that they brought the program out thinking it would be a great thing for Canadians to get into home ownership and the utilization. Was I, okay. She wants to go because she's worried. Well, Jeff, you're on. Um, okay. Hey, Jeff, um, we'll go and she'll just go, uh, awesome. Uh, she'll Oh, he found it. <laughs> so anyways, never uh, had an important call. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, that completely lose, made me lose my train of thought. I'm not going to lie. Uh, so the shared equity program. Um, so the shared equity program was initially designed for people to be able to buy up to four times their income up to $120,000. So, you know, the original program really kind of capped people around the $500,000 price point. And to be honest with you, they qualified for more without the program. Uh, there was also a maximum income in the in the situation, which was one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So that has been increased to one hundred and fifty. Can be the household income, and now they'll allow you to go to four and a half times on the purchase price. So where before your max purchase price was about five hundred thousand, it's now gone over seven hundred thousand. So if anybody wants to discuss the program, uh, I'm happy to do so. Just remember that you don't get anything for free. So even though you're not making a payment on this 5% portion of your equity, as prices are increasing the way they are, the cost associated with having that payment relief is going to be substantial when you go to sell, provided that the market continues to increase the way it has been. Nice. No, thanks for that, Jeevan. And then that, that's a good, uh, again, just good to know what programs are available. And if, if you do want to learn more, one, there's a link and two, uh, we'll have everybody's email addresses. So uh, we, we want you to, to reach out. This is the goal. So um, please do reach out if you have questions on this one. So I'm just checking the Q&A. We do have one question on the home buyers plan from Arjun. Uh, you're asking about RSP contributions and as a single individual versus spousal. So that plan is available per spouse. Uh, so both spouses would be able to get 35000 from their RSP, assuming they both haven't owned a property and that they've had the amounts in uh, 90 days. Um, uh, if you're referring to the spousal contributions to a home buyer's plan, I mean, uh, no difference. Uh, essentially, it's 35 per spouse, so regardless uh, what accounts they're in. And just to um, just to add to what you're saying there, Eric, uh, the government has brought out some modifications to that program as well. So if you're in a marital dissolution and you need to use the RSP to purchase your matrimonial home from your ex, uh, it's a possible situation there. If you're in a bereavement situation as well, where unfortunately you've lost your spouse, um, that can also put you in a position. Those are case by case basis. Uh, but I just want people to know that there is ways to become a first time buyer again. Uh, a lot of times it's you haven't owned real estate for five years. There's certain there's certain uh, loopholes within the system that allow you to reenter that market as a first time buyer. Uh, the one thing that I want to make very clear to people is that it doesn't matter how many times you've owned a home, you can always buy with 5% down.
Nice. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, lastly, on, on this financial uh, ducks, step number one is, so we've looked at how much you have for the down payment. The down payment is a, is a big portion of uh, the financial puzzle is how much you have set aside. The second part of that is, can you afford it? So uh, one, you need to have the significant capital to afford the down payment. I mean, up to five to 20. And then you also need to be able to afford the mortgage payments uh, and live your lifestyle, which is very important. So uh, yes, it's important to get into a house, but it's also important to, to live and you don't want to be a house poor and having an Uber everywhere to work if uh, you've put all your funds in one basket. So you want to make sure that you've gone through that, that line and, and assessed, these are my costs and this is what happens if uh, maybe I lose my job or if my spouse loses their job, can we still afford this? So that's part of the exercise that you want to do before you start looking at homes because uh, uh, you get emotionally invested very quickly. So make sure you do your homework. So last thing on this point is you want to have an estimate of what your mortgage payments would look like easy enough, go to a calculator online once you see uh, what you qualify for, which we'll get to. Uh, your property taxes, uh, same thing. There's a calculator online. You can plug those in. Utilities and hydro, say $100 a month. I mean, you don't need to be exact on these, but you want to have a reasonable idea. I mean, if, if you're 30% off, that's fine. Uh, for, for hydro and utilities, that's okay. You just want to have an amount. That way you can, you can reasonably estimate what the costs will be. Uh, same thing with condo fees. If you're buying a condo or uh, even a townhouse that uh, will likely have condo fees. We live in a townhouse here and um, where it's, it's semi, semi detached and there's, you still have to pay for, for road maintenance. So they're likely, uh, if you're buying in that type of development, you will have monthly condo fees to pay home insurance as well. you got to tack that on. Uh, likely you want cable. If you're buying a house with different rooms, uh, you'll have a lot of TVs and you'll need to, uh, to plug that in. So, and uh, Rogers is not exactly cheap. So now there are other ways to cord cut, but you want to just make sure that you're living the lifestyle. You don't want to be living in a house where you can't afford anything else. So you want to make sure that uh, you know what you're buying and that uh, you've done your due diligence. So list these costs annually, monthly, doesn't have to be exact, but it just gives you a rough idea for uh, what that would entail and what lifestyle that would allow you uh, to live. Okay, Jeevan, it's almost time for your, uh, your wisdom lesson. So step two is once you've done that homework, it's, it's time to start looking for pre-approval and uh, it's time to start looking for, for mortgage options. So with uh, step one, so we're going to look at uh, mortgages. Jeevan's going to give you a nice primer on uh, what mortgages are and what, what you should look for. Uh, and then he can talk about uh, some of the pre-approval process and what that looks like. So Jeevan, if you want to take it away from here, please. Awesome. Well, uh, that was some great information you shared, Eric. Um, the one thing I just wanted to give everybody a, a brief history on who I am. I didn't just pick up a sign one day and decide to become a mortgage broker. Um, I was lucky enough to be a regional manager for a major mortgage company uh, right out of university. And that was way back uh, in 2002. And uh, it took me about two years on that side, uh, on the corporate side, to realize that uh, while I play well with others, I don't do well with management. So, uh, you know, self-employment was definitely the path for me. And um, Circle Mortgage Group has been around since 2016. Uh, we're rated A-plus at the Better Business Bureau and five stars anywhere you can find us. And the reason is quite simple. It's not that we bribe our clients into five-star ratings, uh, but if that'll work, let me know. The, the real reason is, is that we give people an honest opinion on where they are in the process and what they need to do to be successful. Uh, part of my philosophy in general is, is that nobody should ever um, mince words when it comes to your health and your wealth. And I know the guys here at Asante do a great job for their customers in making sure that uh, their wealth is growing. I know these guys personally, and, and I know your money is safe with them. Uh, as a matter of what we're doing here, <laughs> excuse me. you know, I wanted to, uh, so the first thing I wanted to start with is just a kind of um, a where's where in the market. I'm sure we're all seeing the news stories um, and Sandy will speak about this as well. Prices year over year are growing at over 20%. So while Eric's advice in the first segment of, you know, aiming for 20% uh, is very good advice and it's sound advice if it's possible for you. What I would say is, is that find out what you need to enter this marketplace. Right now, I kind of equate it to a moving train and the ticket is literally getting more expensive by the day. So if you're trying to let your savings catch up to, uh, to the market, unless you invested in BlackBerry on January 1st for some godforsaken reason, um, you know, it would have been, it would be very difficult for you to outpace 
uh, the growth that's happening in real estate prices. And this is not a new phenomenon. Um, while it hits the news cycle like it's new every time it happens, this has been happening steadily since 2010. Uh, in 2009, we had a price correction that lasted about six weeks. Since then, it has been positive price growth year over year over year over year. Uh, for those people that say that the sky is falling, had they listened to them back in 2010, our customers would be down about 250% of a property value. So, you know, at the end of the day, shelter is one of the most important costs of your life. You need to like where you live because it's where you're going to spend most of your time, especially. Oops. Now with COVID is, is that, you know, let's do the math right? Let's simply do the math. If, if you've been relying on calculators and, and web tools to try and figure out what you qualify for, just stop, just stop. Give somebody like myself a call, uh, whether it's me directly or somebody within your own circle, pardon the pun, my company's called circle, but um, even if it's somebody within your own team, just find out, you know, brass tacks, what can you qualify for? And it will change from property to property. Um, somebody over on the side had asked a question about the bidding process for homes and what can be done to succeed in the current environment. What's happening is, is a lot of people are being given a pre-approval certificate, but that pre-approval certificate is set to a, you know, a fixed parameter. And what I mean is it's, it's to a condo fee of X and a property tax of Y and a heat component of Z equals your pre-approval amount. But every property you're looking at, those ratios are actually different. So the price that you could pay for property A is not necessarily the same as the price you could afford to pay for property B. That's why it's so important to have somebody like me on your team, because what we're actually doing for our clients and, and especially for our, our busier realtors is that every time that their client is prepared to make an offer, we are doing an analysis based on that particular property to give the client their max ability to pay. And the reason that is so important is a um, financing conditions. If you were to, if you were to put an offer in today in a multiple offer scenario, it's very unlikely to be successful if you have a financing condition. And the reason is quite simple. They've got 10 other offers that don't have that condition. So why would they, you know, it's common sense. If you're looking at why, you know, how um, a seller is comparing offers there, it, it is one of the few areas that common sense is 100% prevalent. Uh, relevant and there. So anyways, let's get into this mortgage talk. Um, I just wanted to share those details up front. You need pros in your corner. Uh, God bless the, the realtor that just started and is a friend of your family. I'm sure that one day they will do very well. God bless the mortgage agent that just picked up their license and decided to uh, enter this arena. Yeah. You know what? There's a lot of fish in the sea this is that we all have to get somewhere. And if you want an experience that you're likely to be more successful at, no offense to anybody, but those of us with some experience have kind of seen these situations before. Um, and I may have frozen because you guys have frozen, of course. Am I back? I yeah, you're back. Okay, I'm back. Uh, yeah, no. So what I was saying is, is that the strategy itself is so important. And, and that's why you need pros in your corner. Uh, I, I see it over and over again, right? Somebody has been dealing with a realtor had no success in selling their home, or in, in getting into the properties that they want. They activate a guy like Sandy, they activate a guy like myself. And two weeks later, they own a home, right? It's a matter of what do you want to do? right? Do you want to watch the market? If you want to watch the market, that's awesome. There's this place called MLS or realtor.ca or Zolo or wherever you want to go. That'll allow you to watch these prices fly. Uh, the same way you can watch a ticker on any stock market, you can watch these prices fly. But the point is, is that if you want to be successful, you need a plan and you need a strategy. And Eric, I'm going to get you to consistently nod your head. So then I know I'm not frozen. <laughs> so if that's okay with you. Um, okay. So fixed versus variable rates. The spread between fixed and variable rates has traditionally been about 75 basis points. So between 50 to, to three quarters of 1% um, has been the difference between these rates. If you're dealing with a major bank and you're not dealing with me for your mortgage, please do me a favor, take a variable. 
And the reason I say to take a variable in those situations is that it is the only product at a major bank that has a standardized penalty, which means that if you ever need to break that mortgage, in most cases, you can be out on a three month interest penalty. If you were to make the mistake of taking a fixed rate mortgage at a major bank today, you would be subjecting yourself to something called an interest rate differential penalty. And I'm going to talk about this really quickly because it's very important. I had a conversation with somebody uh, about two weeks back, the young great, great girl and is engaged and her future mother-in-law is a former branch manager at a red bank. And when we were sitting, having our conversation, I had presented a rate to them and the client came back to me and said that their mother-in-law wanted to get on a call because she could get them a lower rate at that red bank because she used to work there. Pardon my phone ringing. Uh, I guess one of you guys really want to get started on that plan. <laughs> but uh, So in our conversation, when I was talking, I was I, at that point, I was able to offer these people a rate of 1.84%. And the red bank was offering them 1.72%. So the client said to me and the client's, uh, the client's mother-in-law was on the call as well. And she said to me, she said, well, you know, I can get them 1.72% from the branch that, uh, that I worked at. And I thought, wow, that's wonderful. And my next point was, is that you're asking me to match their, and she said, what? And I said, well, you come from the branch world, you know what penalties look like on a five-year fixed rate mortgage. So tell me if I match. Even you froze. Match their rate. When I said to her, I said, what is the relevance that the prices of apples have on the prices of oranges? Because realistically, they're both fruit. So they're both mortgages, but they couldn't be more different. And the reason is, is the back end contract legalese, which is not explained to clients on the front end. You're expected to read it on your own. And if you're not dealing with a professional, they're not going to insulate you from this because it's going to be one of those buyer beware situations and they all have e &O anyways. So my only point again, to, to reiterate that is that if you're going with a major bank where you've deposited your paycheck since you're 14 years old, more power to you, but don't do it in the capacity of a fixed rate mortgage because the penalty to break say a $500,000 mortgage on a fixed rate today was say three years left on the loan uh, could be over $30,000. So when you look at, Eric, I need you to nod in case I froze. Yep. Okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Every time you freeze, I freeze. Um, so the point is, is that, can you imagine that you need to sell your home because of something happening to you in your life and the bank charges you 30 G's on the way out the door just because of a contract, uh, because of some legalese when they're never forced to prove that the fact that they actually have to relend the money at that? I've gotten into this conversation with MPs. I've gotten into it with MPPs. I've gotten into it with a former minister of finance. Um, I won't put this soapbox away for people. Uh, this is the type of thing that is an industry I believe we need to, to force change upon. But just to let you know, uh, the red bank and the green bank are the two big, biggest banks in, in, the, in the broker channel. So uh, this is the advice I give. It's not necessarily the advice that you'll receive from other, uh, other counterparts of mine. But fixed and variable rates. So we know to go variable to protect ourselves from the penalty, but fixed rates today are actually available in some cases to be cheaper than what you would get on a variable rate mortgage. So if you are, if you are dealing with a broker bank, um, which is not using any posted rates in the calculation of your interest, then I would greatly recommend looking at the five-year fix today because it can be had down around one and a half percent, anywhere from one and a half to, to 1.94, Sandy will tell you it is historically cheap money, historically. Like we've seen cheap paper in 2016, we were down around 214. That was about as low as it went. Uh, it's funny, you, you present 214 to somebody today and they're gonna wonder if you're trying to rip them off or not. Uh, so uh, the only thing I would other say, also say in fixed to variable rates is that when you're looking at those low rate websites or those rate comparison websites, their job is to bait you. And what I mean is, is to show you the lowest available rate possible, forgetting what the, you know, the caveats and the restrictive covenants are on those products. So you may think that you saved five bucks a month or 50 bucks a month or, or 100 bucks a month, but you are giving up something to get that savings. And it's usually flexibility 
and penalty structure. So I just want to give people a heads up on that. Term and amortization. So the average mortgage term in Canada, you'll see that more than 80% of people in Canada take a five-year fixed rate mortgage. Why? Um, well, it's half a decade and one-fifth of 25 years. So it's Even you're back to freeze. <laughs> As we get Jeevan back, Jeevan, maybe if you want to, if you can hear me, uh, if you want to tether your phone, maybe if, see if, uh, see if so, you most people seem to. You don't know if you heard that, but maybe if, if you have tethering, maybe we'll see if that works. Yeah. So um, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. That's uh, I swear to God, I'm not cheap. It's just the best internet I can get at this office. Um, but what I was saying is, is that for term and amortization, yeah, 25 years is your maximum amortization for anything less than 20% down. The maximum uh, with more than 20% down on average is 30 years. There's one or two lenders out there that will still do a 35 year amortization, but they do charge a serious premium on their interest rate to do that. Uh, so it's very likely that you'll go with a 25 or a 30 year amortization. Options and clauses, make sure that the product that you're getting, uh, that you understand the penalty up front. And even if you're, if you're dealing with me, it'll be explained to you anyways. But if you're dealing with a third party, please just tell them very clearly, show me where the penalty language is. And they'll have to show you and they'll have to explain it and ask how your interest rate is calculated, especially if it's in a fixed rate scenario, because if they're using a posted rate, it puts you in a very precarious situation when you go to break that mortgage. The reason I keep talking about penalties, guys, and hey, watch out for this, watch out for that, is honestly, and Sandy will tell you, when you finally get that home, like your serotonin levels in your brain will be firing at such a high level that honestly, I could tell you to give me a blood test that day, and you would, uh, because you're so excited to finally be there. I kind of rate it as the third happiest day of your life behind marriage and childbirth, and the, the, the level of elation that you feel, um, once you purchase a home, you'll realize that, no, you, you are bucket listing something. You're checking something off your bucket list. You've got a whole new level of maturity in front of you. Uh, you know, cash flow's changing, life's changing. It's also positive. Um, that's why that's why other institutions are trying to take advantage of that mindset and, and get you into products that will limit your flexibility in the future. And I'll tell you, limiting your flexibility is what allows them to charge you a higher price in the future. Not necessarily on the first term, but at renewal, good luck negotiating. Uh, property taxes and mortgages. Uh, property tax is actually the only thing that supersedes a mortgage in collection. Meaning that if a house was to go power of sale and there's 10 grand in property taxes owing, uh, they're paid first. So what you'll find is, is that as a first time buyer, especially, Every institution out there will be happy to pay your taxes for you uh, and collect them from you monthly or biweekly, however, uh, however you choose to pay. The only thing I'd say be careful of is that some banks will require you to remit 18 months worth of taxes in 12 months, meaning that they want a quote unquote reserve account. If you have more than 10% down, they will allow you to pay your own property taxes. And I would greatly recommend that you do that. Now doing it, you set up a pre-authorized debit program with the, with the city and they just take it out monthly, just like your mortgage payment, but then you're not stuck in, an, you know, paying 18 months worth of taxes in 12 months. And it's not like those taxes are remitted to the, to the bank or to the city. Uh, they sit in the bank's account. Uh, what they do with it, God knows, they probably don't earn any interest on it, but it is indeed sitting there. Mortgage insurance. So mortgage, so CMHC default insurance um, and Genworth, which is now uh, Sagan Insurance, and then we have Canada Guarantee as well. Guys, this is when I'm talking and I'm saying, get into the market as soon as you can. If you can find a property that you can buy with 5% down and you can make the payments work, don't wait. And the reason I say don't wait is because real estate is a leveraged investment. Even though on a $500,000 property, excuse me, your down payment required is only $25,000, the guys here will let you know that your appreciation is occurring on the value of the property itself. So that 500 grand. So in today's marketplace, even at a 15% appreciation, which is low um, in this market, at a 15% appreciation on a $500,000 property, that property is 575 a year from now. On a $25,000 investment, 
you'll have returned $75,000 in equity. That is almost what, 3X, 4X on a $25,000 investment. And the beauty is, is that, and you know, people will say to me, hey, you know, uh, the places that we like are all $700,000. Here's my statement to those people. If you're going to continue to rent and that's your strategy, no problem. Go become a landlord at the same time. Purchase real estate so you're in the market and that you can have somebody else paying that mortgage. So at least you're getting some benefit of the historic appreciations that are occurring year over year. Now, that's all historical results, right? So I'm going to throw a caveat in here. I can't predict the future. Uh, but with without major changes to the offer process and without a major change to interest rates, I don't foresee limitations on this growth because in all honesty, if anything was going to correct this market, COVID should have done it and it didn't and it couldn't. In March of last year, I remember being included in an article where I was like, okay, well, we're probably going to be working from home soon because I can't imagine there's going to be much to do. I had no clue what May was going to look like. Uh, or, or June, you know, the goal was really to keep the lights on this year. As long as, you know, on January 1, 2021, Circle Mortgage still existed and we had a place to turn on the lights, it was a win. The market went bananas come, come May when people realize that, oh, the world's not ending. People are still working. Now we're saving even more. Heck, people are looking at their walls 24 seven and deciding, heck, this is not the place for me. If I'm going to be stuck in these homes for the next two years or however long we're in eternal lockdown, uh, you need to like the place that you live. And that's what's led people to start to look outside of Toronto proper and, and move into these ancillary markets. We have people that are looking, you know, Sandy, you probably see this. We have people looking that were in Toronto looking as far as Brantford or Cambridge, right? Areas that are feeder cities, St. Catharines, Niagara, Welland. I saw a property go 100K over ask in Welland. Anybody that's ever been to Welland has to ask themselves, how the heck did that happen? Um, I went to Brock University, so I have a good idea of what Welland looks like. And uh, I, I still don't get that. So mortgage insurance is there to allow you to transact for less than 20% down. Guys, buy as soon as you can. Um, as much as 20% is a wicked philosophy. I actually, even, uh, even when I meet people with 20% down, you know, there's so many wicked investment opportunities out there today. And with an interest rate being below 2%, uh, it behooves me to tell you to put that money into another area because the real estate is going to increase in its value, no matter what your down payment was. Um, yeah. And then pre-approval process again, guys, you know, um, bank versus broker. So there's a couple things that we do different. One is we work directly with your realtor. So if you decide to work with Sandy and Sandy chooses to send you our way, uh, Sandy will receive constant updates on whatever we're doing with you. So he has the tools that he needs needs to be effective for you and somebody a pre-approval to Sandy on a $500,000 purchase, but with $1,500 in property tax, I've handcuffed him before he can even get out the door. And what I'm doing is, is I'm hurting both of us because I'm pissing off our client to make them think they qualify for 500 when realistically it's closer to 420. And, and what happens in those situations is, is that a lot of times when you're dealing with your bank, they're not doing a full underwrite on your situation. They're asking you very basic questions about your income. They may not be pulling a credit bureau at all. And then they're spitting a number out at you, just like any internet calculator would. Uh, the process here is completely different. We vet your income information up front. We vet as much of your information as possible up front so that when you are transacting, you're not disappointed because realistically, when people aren't dealing, when people are transacting without having done the correct legwork up front, the only people they're fooling is themselves. And their realtor, unfortunately, who's driving them to 40 different properties and managing 50 offer presentations. But realistically, if they haven't done the math, like there's no use in hiding under the sheets on this. You need to know where you stand. And if you go to circlemortgage.ca, just click apply now and we'll have you set within 24 hours. That's it for me. Well done, Jeevan. So, I mean, lots, lots to learn as you're as you're looking to get your first mortgage, but I mean, Jeevan's giving you a really good idea of these are the levers and, and don't just fix on the rate because that's what's being pushed. I mean, same, we see it in the, the financial industry. All, all that's being pushed are, are the fees, whereas well, that's only part of the a minor part of the equation. You need to know the whole 
picture. Um, and, and the fees up front for the mortgage rate are only a small amount of that whole transaction. So that's that's a very important point. And yeah, uh, just one thing. I noticed Jeff put something saying that he recommends somebody do a lifeboat test on the mortgage by adding two points to the mortgage rate oh. to see if it's still affordable. Um, that's actually the stress test. So the stress test rate today is 4.79%. Um, so anybody that's qualifying for an insured mortgage today would do so at a rate of 4.79. Guys, it's literally three times higher <laughs> than the rate you're actually paying. Uh, so, you know, as a matter of where, where the, where the government, uh, what's up Jeff, uh, where the government has, you know, taken their logic in this, this is just an artificial deflation of what people qualify for. Um, you know, if you were to take a look at where the average five-year rate actually sits today, we should all be qualifying at a rate of about 2% which would add about 25 to 30% to your buying power. And uh, that's probably the last thing this market needs right now. So I'll, uh, I digress, but uh, it, so Jeff, just for your own comfort, that is taking place daily uh, with our stress test rate of 4.79. Nice. Thanks for that, Stephen. That's good, thank you. All right, so we've done one, you've done your homework, you've listed your assets, you know how much you can afford, you've contacted Jeevan or somebody uh, in that realm, hopefully Jeevan to, uh, to get a sense for what you'd actually qualify for. You're getting pretty close, you've almost done your homework. So now it's, uh, it's a question of assembling your team. And uh, with that, we'll, we'll get Sandy in, uh, but I mean, the most important part of that is one, is working, finding a realtor, uh, and then building up the rest of that team. But uh, essentially it does start with your realtor. So uh, with that, I wanted to pass it over to Sandy and see if uh, you can outline kind of what the realtor does, at what point a, a new buyer should be interacting with the realtor uh, and how can you help with the process of, of matching clients with the home? Absolutely, thank you, Eric, for that introduction. Uh, you can hear me okay, I presume at this point. Not see me okay, hear me okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, Jeevan, that was a great presentation. Lots of valuable information for everybody there. Um, I hope I can add to this conversation with some real estate agent specifics that will help as well. May I suggest right away, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or put it in the conversation at the bottom for everybody to see. I'm also going to give you my personal cell phone number. If you're a bit embarrassed or a bit self-conscious about asking a question and you think it's maybe something that's common sense or that it's, you'd be embarrassed if it was brought up on the screen, my direct cell phone number is 416-230-1700. That is my direct number. Feel free to call me or text me. Uh, once the call is over, I'd be happy to dialogue or talk with you and, of course, help you down the road. Um, I've been a real estate agent for 32 years here in the Metro Toronto area. It's been an exciting ride, um, an exciting journey for me as a person. And I hope for the people watching out there that are maybe getting into the process for the first time or just trying to update their knowledge and are already homeowners. Again, I hope that Jeevan and myself can help you get to the next step, whatever that might be in your life. We called it a first time buyer seminar. I'm willing to bet some of the people watching already own a home and congratulations to those who do. For those who don't, we're here to help. For those that do, again, we're here to update your knowledge and help you get to the next step, whatever that might be. Um, a real estate agent is a facilitator and a real estate agent is a negotiator. A real estate agent can be a, a therapist at times. We wear a lot of hats, but Overall, it's been a great career and I'm still very much engaged in it, still very much enjoy it. And for those of you that are even career planning out there, you find a career that you enjoy as much as I enjoy real estate and you're gonna, you're gonna have a long successful career going ahead because enjoying it is a big part of it. And that for me is important. My background is I have an engineering degree and an MBA in marketing and I work for a large telecommunications company but wasn't happy there. Got into real estate in 1988 and it's been a, it's been very enjoyable since. And again, look forward to helping you. We've got a few stuff that we can, a few points, excuse me, that we can cover here today. But again, feel free to interrupt me or contact me directly, as I said earlier. Eric, you've covered a lot of stuff already. Jeevan, you've covered a lot of stuff already as well. I'm gonna try and keep my comments brief because we've gone off, I think over time here already or close to it from, from our set schedule. Uh, maybe Eric, can we go to the 10 points uh, now just to yeah. sort of keep things moving along here? That's okay. <laughs> it's okay, Jeevan. It was con good content. <laughs> All right, Sandy. Thank you. 
All right. So first, con first thought, and again, these are just general thoughts. So please, they maybe don't flow completely together, but there are important, important points that I'd like to talk to. Number one, real estate is the key component of a balanced portfolio. What's a balanced portfolio? That means don't put all your eggs in one basket. That means you probably should have some equities, i.e. stocks and bonds. It means you may have a cash component. A cash component is money that's available to take advantage of good situations that come along. And also a third component, which is the real estate, which is what we're talking about today. Do you put all your eggs in one basket? You may have to, to get in to the process, the real estate process that is. You may have to put every penny in you have. In the long term, I don't personally recommend that though. I think a balanced portfolio means that you are protected, you are sheltered, you're insulated from the ups and downs. If the real estate market does happen to correct at some point, and who knows it might for various reasons out of our control, it's unlikely that the stock market will correct at the same time. And it's unlikely that the bond market will correct at the same time. Is it possible all three could go to hell in a handbasket at the same time? Possible. But having a diversified portfolio with many eggs in your basket of different types will insulate you from that fall or that correction most likely. So should you have other things? Yes. The second part of that first point is owning rental properties will help you as well. So yes, you want to own your principal property. We didn't talk about this much, but uh, Jeff can help you with it. Jeff Watchman or Eric, our moderator today can help you with it. There are many tax advantages to owning your own home. Essentially in Canada, we get two tax advantages every year and you should try and take advantage of them every year as best you can. Number one is to contribute to an RSP every year to your maximum, even if you have to borrow the money. This is my personal point of view. Always take your maximum RSP every year. Second one is to own your principal residence. Your principal residence is where you live. It is capital gains exempt. Whatever prop, uh, profit you make on your principal residence is tax free. Completely, 100% capital gains, income tax free. So if you make $100,000 on your principal residence in the next 12 months, which is possible in the market we're in right now, that is 100% tax free money. For a lot of us, wow, we'd have to work at least a full year or maybe even two years to get that kind of income and then be taxed on top of that. So to make $100,000 on real estate, uh, you know, capital gains exempt, wow. That is a profound effect on your, on your net worth. And going forward, it will continue to compound. So you want to take advantage of both of those tax advantages. Number one, the RSP, as I mentioned earlier. Number two is the real estate, which is the purpose of today's Zoom call. Real estate is a good investment in the long run, and you always should own your principal residence. Principal residence is capital gains exempt. It is the way to go. Do you want to go to the next step and own rental properties? I suggest yes, down the road. But first things first, you got to own your first home and live in it to get those benefits first before we talk about the rental properties. Number two, and this is just compounds onto number one. If you are living in a rental, all you're doing is paying the mortgage for your landlord. You're just making him or her rich. That's all you're doing. And I hate to use words like that, but that's essentially what you're doing. Because the home you live in, even if it's an apartment building, someone owns it. Maybe it's a corporation. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a group of people. You're paying their mortgage for them every month. They love you because you're paying their bills. And in the long run, that property is going to go up in value and they're going to reap the profits. So if you are renting, and for many reasons, we all do rent, you know, especially when we start off in life, we can't afford maybe right away to buy. In the back of your mind, you should remember I'm being penalized because I'm not getting the capital gains. I'm not making profit and I'm being further penalized because I'm helping my landlord get rich by paying him every month. He's making the money on the property going up in value. So in a short term, do we rent? Of course we do. We have to start somewhere in the long term. You don't want to be renting. You don't want to be stuck in that syndrome where you're in a rental for the rest of your life or the next 20 years or the next 10 years, if you can possibly help it. Again, this is my suggestion. I think that Jeevan and Eric would agree with me on it. It's one of the fundamental beliefs in life. You should own your own home, whether it's a condo, a townhouse, a detached, whether you live in Barrie, Kingston, Calgary. And for those of you who are in this call, possibly from outside the GTA, similar rules apply. And 
again, similar uh, points here are all applicable. So we're talking about GTA Toronto a lot because that's where we're based and that's where our call is. For any of you that need help outside of the GTA, I'm here to guide you. I know a lot of good realtors in other provinces and other cities. My area of expertise is the GTA of Toronto. Jeevan, I believe you can help anywhere in Canada if I'm not mistaken, so you can help people elsewhere. I can guide people elsewhere as well, but personally couldn't represent you. Step number three, if you're buying, be prepared to pay fair value. I see this all the time. People come in with expectations. Yeah, we're ready to buy a home. Okay, Sandy, you're our man. We're going to buy a home. Let's go see homes. We want a deal. We want to see foreclosures. We want to try and get blood from the bank. We want to try and get below fair market value. That is not going to be a productive mindset. You have to be prepared to pay fair value, maybe even a bit more than fair value in today's bidding process. But going in thinking, I'm going to steal a home, Sandy, you're going to steal a home for me, we're going to find a foreclosure, we're going to find a bank repossession, we're going to find a distress sale where there was a death in the home, we're going to find something and get it below value, highly, highly unlikely. It, I'd love to do that for you. I'm just saying that's not a realistic expectation and it doesn't happen that often because there are tens of thousands of other buyers out there that are willing to snap up bargains as they come along. And homes that get underlisted in value, they get bidding wars. You've heard the term bidding war. That's where there's multiple bids on a property. Often they go way over full price. So their property's asking $599. Um, as uh, we talked about earlier, Ajeevan mentioned there was 47 offers. It may go for $649 or $749, which is way, way above full price. You went in hoping to buy it for full price or less, you're gonna be disappointed 99 times out of 100, unfortunately. So again, set realistic expectations. Don't be looking for the home run. The home run is too good to be true. It probably was, is too good to be true and is not gonna happen. You're gonna go away with a bad taste in your mouth. You're gonna be disappointed. You're gonna say, wow, that didn't go very well. We did not get that home run. And because we didn't get the home run, I'm not happy and I'm not enjoying the process. So realistic expectations and realistic expectations result in happy people at the end of the day. Sandy, just one point on that, because I mean, with a lot of the new home buyers, uh, or the younger generation that were expected to get things now, or we're used to be getting things when we want them. I mean, uh, you might've seen this with, with a few younger clients. Uh, do you know roughly how many properties they're, they're seeing or what the process is like, just because so we can give an idea of expectations as to uh, that process for uh, younger individuals looking to get into the market. So they, they, they know the first one might not be the one that you, you end up with. Yeah, good question, Eric. Yeah, so a lot of the clients that I work with directly, I would say on average, they see anywhere from 20 to 30 properties before they purchase. And often when they make an offer, they don't get the first one, as Eric just alluded to. So often they get the third or fourth or fifth offer that they put in. The first two or three they don't get, not because they didn't make a good offer, it's because someone else made a better offer. And then the takeaway from that is, Okay, we saw this property. It was asking $599. We offered $650. It sold for $675. Obviously, they went with the $675 offer. We learned from that. And then the, again, I sit down with the buyers after that unfortunate situation where they don't get it. And I say, let's learn from this experience. I know you're down. I know you're frustrated. I know you're mad. I know you're disappointed. Let's learn from it. So next time we won't have the same outcome. We'll have a positive outcome, hopefully on the next one. We had to bid more. Clearly we didn't bid enough. Well, Sandy, we paid what we thought it was worth. Understand, but someone else obviously thought it was worth more and paid more. Next time, let's not have the same outcome. Let's be a little more analytical. Let's not try and hit the home run. Let's be prepared to pay fair value on the next one, whatever that might be for that area, that style, that house, that location, that street and much better chance of success next time, hopefully, because we learned from this one. No, oh, that's great. So again, life is a learning experience. Sometimes we have to have the difficult lesson before we get the successful outcome. And there's a prime example of what can happen. Mm -hmm. And again, I, the, the next point in point three, or the second part of point three, is consider buying further out. So for example, everybody, when they're young, wants to be closer to the center of the universe in their mind, let's say downtown Toronto or downtown Calgary or downtown wherever they may be because it's close to where the restaurants, the bars, the sports are, uh, the theaters, whatever the case is. In today's world, 
actually the suburbs are doing slightly better than the downtown core. The downtown core of Toronto, for example, is doing well. The suburbs, uh, for us, the 905 area code stuff, which is what surrounds the 416 area code stuff, is actually doing better than the downtown core percentage wise. People are migrating further out because of working at home and Zoom calls like this one, people realize they can work from home. And if I've got good internet at home, home could be Barrie, home could be Kingston, home could be Hamilton, home could be Brampton where I happen to live. So you have more choices. So the suburbs are actually doing better than the downtown core and moving further out, you typically get better value for your money. So moving further out in your search criteria can actually give you great results and you may be happier in the long run. When we get out of lockdown in a year's time or nine months or 18 months or whenever it is, people may start migrating back down to the downtown core of the city, wherever they are. But I suggest you this could be a big shift in housing expectations going forward because people, once they get out to the burbs, they see that they have a front yard, a backyard, they can park two cars, they have three bathrooms instead of one bathroom, and they're still walking distance to all the essential services they need. There could be a long-term shift here towards suburbs as opposed to crowding into 852 square feet downtown Toronto on the 42nd floor. Nothing against that, but I'm just saying the suburbs offer better value and for the first time buyer, better value may mean the difference between getting it and not getting it. Um, again, and then we talked about down payment and what we're finding right now, a common trend is for a lot of people is they have to borrow their down payment. Maybe some of us have just come out of university or we're still carrying school debt or university debt or car loans or whatever the case is. So we may have a net worth of not very much, maybe even zero, maybe even slightly negative. So what's common out there is uh, people are borrowing their down payment, as we call it, from the bank of mom and dad. Sometimes you have to, again, go to your parents or your relatives to borrow your down payment. Because as Jeevan correctly identified earlier, more than once, you can't save as fast as the market's going up right now. That may change going forward. The markets do change. They go up, they go down. But overall, the real estate market has been going up steadily since ugh, 1995. It's probably gone up 24 the last 25 years. Um, there hasn't been a lot of downtime and you just can't save generally as fast as the market's going up. What if you don't have a parent to borrow from? Well, obviously that's off the table, but you need the down payment to buy. And if you can get it, it helps. It will expedite the process faster and we recommend it. It may have to be off off the paper, i.e. not an official loan that's registered on title or something like that, because the banks will see that and use that against you in your loan application, or Jeevan may have to consider that in the pre-approval process, but an off the record loan from your parents could make the difference between you buying and not buying. And it's a very common thing. Jeevan, you wanna add I something? Jump in. Uh, they're not called loans, they're called gifts. Just Sorry. don't call me and be like, oh, my parents are loaning me 200 Gs. No, it's a gift, guys. It's a gift. You guys decided whatever way you want on the back end. But for the purpose of what I got to do, it's a gift. And co-signers yeah. rock. Thank you. I appreciate that. There you go. And there's another alternative. So there's a couple takeaways for you first-time buyers out there that are slightly stressed going, I don't have 100 grand down. I don't have 50 grand. I don't have any grand down right now to buy a home. How am I going to get into this situation? Well, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to give you some guidance. Jeevan will give you some guidance. I, Sandy Kennedy, will give you some guidance. We'll help you get through this process. Maybe it'll be a gift from the parents or your uncle or your aunt, or maybe two of you will pool your money together. So who knows? There are options there, but each situation is a little different. That's why I said earlier, here's my cell phone number that I gave to you earlier. You may want to speak to myself or Jeevan separately in a private meeting, and we can guide you and tailor a program that works for your situation. And Point you, number four. Uh, from the Sorry, audience, I mean, you, you were mentioning the, the shift kind of from downtown. This question is uh, mostly on the downtown side of things for high rise condos. Uh, is there a ceiling price per square foot that you stay within? I mean, I, I'm assuming this is GTA, but are there any rules of thumb that you like to share with clients? Say, say they're looking at high rise condos or uh, I mean, even even younger family homes. Uh, are there any assumptions or, or rules of thumb that you like to share either for maintenance or for square footage that you, you think are good to? assumption post 
Yeah. Yeah. Eric, I, I have to be honest with you. I am not a big supporter of downtown Toronto condos. I think that that's a very volatile market. And this year we've already seen some correction there. I believe the correction is over. Um, but I'm just, I just don't agree with a thousand dollars a square foot that they're getting downtown Toronto. And that's what it is. Give or take, it's actually higher in the prime buildings, but you're paying a thousand dollars a square foot. So if you buy a thousand square foot condo, which would be a small two bedroom condo down there, you're paying over a million dollars and plus maintenance fees, plus property taxes. Uh, gosh, for, for out in the suburb, out in the suburbs, you can for a million dollars in Peel and Brampton, Mississauga, you can get a you can get a detached home with three, four bedrooms, double car garage, uh, a 40 by 100 lot on a quiet street in a nice area. Sorry, you were going to say something, Jeevan, maybe there? Oh, or no, I, I just, I had to jump in because that's what I do. But um, Sandy, do you remember when we used to laugh about 500 bucks a square foot? Absolutely. Thought, oh my God, this market is bananas. People are paying 500 bucks a foot to live in Toronto? Yeah. That wasn't that long ago. And no, the price has more than doubled. And and the one thing I, the only comment I would make on, on Toronto proper downtown is that while there's a lot of Airbnb investors that are looking to pull the parachute and get out of that market, the real estate investment trusts and a lot of savvy buyers are snapping them up as soon as they can because they realize that the exodus is temporary. So if, if you're thinking downtown and, and you want to be there, definitely go for it because right now might be the only time that you're going to get something that would reflect market value for you. But Sandy's got great advice for you. If you're spending a mill, do it on a house. <laughs> yeah. And, and again, please, it's all personal decisions, everybody. It's just like some people like chocolate, some people like vanilla, some people like uh, four door cars and other people like two door sports cars. And there's no right or wrong answer. It's personal choice. Uh, but the question was asking about the dollars per square foot. I'm, I am a real estate investor. I own several properties. I don't own anything in downtown Toronto and maybe I missed out on that opportunity, but I assure you the other stuff that we've owned has done very well. And I'm very pleased that I was in the game, so to speak. And that, that's a point we'll come to in a few minutes. You don't have to own 20 properties. You don't have to own five properties. You don't have to own downtown Toronto. You want to be in the game. You want to be in the process. So when the market goes up and everything goes up, presumably together, percentage wise, you reap the benefits of being in the game as opposed to being outside looking in in a rental which is what is the biggest crisis i would see for people you don't want to stay in a rental maybe you don't have a standard a stable employment situation maybe you're relocating for work or for a relationship or whatever the case is again lots of good reasons for renting but not in the long term um, point number four, if we could go over to there on my list of four there, uh, when is the best time to buy real estate? Thank you very much. As soon as possible is what Jeevan said. And I double ditto, double, 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 triple ditto. That is the answer. ASAP. We did our first seminar, Jeevan and I together, I think it was February of last year, sorry, 2020 downtown Toronto before COVID hit hard. And, uh, I was telling people to buy, Jeevan was telling people to buy at that point. My gosh, since February of 20, if you just took my advice and Jeevan's advice in February of this year till now, uh, I'm going to say 20%, you'd be up, 18% uh, up, 20% uh, clear. And again, if it was your first home, income tax-free, uh, capital gains exempt. <laughs> Brr, like that's just mind boggling. You can't get those returns elsewhere generally, again, and especially in your principal residence because it's capital gains exempt. So Every penny you make is, is yours. So when do you buy? As soon as you can possibly afford. Um, typically prices are lower in November, December. Um, spring market for us typically start, starts in February, which is just around the corner. We're in the last week of January right now, of course. So prices actually in the next couple of months could go up even higher. And I think that's what I heard Juju even alluding to. And I agree. I think we haven't hit the ceiling yet. I don't think we have maybe, but uh, I don't see it. Uh, I think actually in the next few months, you're going to see prices go up even more. And those who are on the sidelines are going to even be more depressed because they're going to say, wow, man, we should have taken his advice. The, the, again, I talk with my, my subordinates here at the real estate office from time to time over the coffee machine. It's, it's unproductive talk sometimes because I'm not going to make any money from those people. They'll never buy a home from me. But we joke about this. In 1988, when I got my real estate license, if I took the real estate book, it used to come in a book, 
it's all online now, of course now, but the internet basically didn't exist in 1988. And I took a dart and I threw it at the book and I, and whatever property the dart hit, if I bought that property and paid them full price, even if I paid 50 grand too much, I would be so much further ahead today. It's just, it, what I'm saying is if you even get into the market today and you overpaid slightly because you really wanted the property and you got caught up on the hype of a bidding war and you paid 20 grand too much, which could happen. That 20 grand will be surpassed in the next 30 days probably or the next 60 days. And by the end of the year, you'll be giggling, giggling happy because you are so much further ahead than where you were at the start of 2021. So again, please, when's the best time to buy? As soon as you can possibly afford. What's the first step? Meet with someone like Jeevan. And again, go over the pre-approval process. Find out what you can afford. Get that pre-approval as quickly as possible. Next step, of course, to call someone like myself and get out there and start looking at properties. ASAP. I can't overemphasize that. Predicting the real estate market will be very difficult, like predicting the future. But again, 25 of the last 26 years we've gone up. Uh, it's a pretty good chance it's going to continue on its trajectory. And I don't think you can save as fast as it's going up. In fact, I know you can't, even if it starts only going up two or three percent a year. But if you leverage that investment by a power of five or a power of eight, <laughs> After-tax money is hard to save, and saving 50 grand of after-tax money for a lot of us is very difficult to do after we live our life and pay for our meals and pay for everything else in our personal life. So ASAP, Jeevan. Uh, the one thing I would like to add to that is when you're looking at the GTA, you need to recognize the fact that our economy in this area, our employment is not based on a single factor. So when you take a look at areas that have been affected negatively during COVID and you've seen price depreciation, uh, I'm looking at you, Alberta, right? So Alberta is very energy centric. So where the energy prices go, their market goes. Fort Mac had people, you know, driving $120,000 pickup trucks, living in $1.2 million semis because the cash was flowing so heavily. That market, when it got hit, it got hit hard uh, because that was a single source of employment. When you're looking at the GTA, we have so many multiple sources of employment and we have such an influx of immigrants, which you got to remember, like we're looking at this market right now and there's about 300,000 people with money waiting to get into Ontario or into Canada. But realistically, more than half of those people are going to settle here. So if you think the competition was a lot right now, wait till these people come in with their cash offers. Um, so, you know, when's the best time to buy? It was yesterday. Uh, when's the second best time to buy? It's today. Uh, because no lie, it is going to be more expensive tomorrow. If you decide that you're going to wait till the spring, more power to you. I just hope you can save uh, and that you can save substantially or that you can leverage your money in investments with the boys, Eric, Jeff and Pear, um, to to try and keep pace with this market because no lie, anybody that's ever run after a moving train will tell you that it's almost impossible to catch it. Uh, I've never tried it. I've only seen it on TV, but the point is, is that participate in this market as soon as you can get into it. And, and like, and like Sandy was saying, there's so many strategies about getting you into your first place. You know, I don't think anybody in this room bought their forever home the first time they transacted. If they did, God bless them, more power to them. But realistically, it's a process and it's a growth. Just like you'll grow with your life and you'll grow with your family, your needs are going to change and your real estate will change. But the key is, is that if you're renting in all those situations, somebody like Sandy or myself that is a landlord is going to say thank you to you because while their property is appreciating 2x, 3x in the time that you've lived there, um, all you've done is establish the sunk cost of rent. So uh, yeah, sorry, that was, that was my point there. Thank you, Jeevan. That's a very good clarification on what I said earlier. And again, I emphasize anybody out there watching wants to contact me directly after the fact or interject right now, always open for Q&A right now and later. Point number five, Eric, if we could jump over to point number five, when is the best time to sell real estate? Well, Sandy, you know, you and you and Jeevan just said, you know, buy, 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 buy as soon as possible and buy and hold. Well, why would I ever want to sell real estate then, my own personal real estate, that is? Well, there is some good opportunities for selling and there are good reasons for selling. Yes, real estate is important to keep. Yes, it's better to keep it in the long term. 
However, there are times when you may wanna sell it. And I put a couple on my chart here, relocating for work or retirement. At the end of the day, we are all gonna retire and we may move out of our current city, community, town, wherever we are to somewhere else that we wanna be like a cottage or Florida or Arizona or whatever makes you happy. So when is the best time to sell? The best time to sell is when you need the money for something else that's important. Buying a sports car, that's not important. That's not a reason to sell real estate. Helping a child to go to university, that's important. Buying a home in Florida because you're now retiring to you know, your, your dream destination at the end of your life or your working life, that is at least, that's a good reason to sell. Prices are usually higher in the spring. So as a seller, flip side of the buyer, you might wanna consider selling in February, March, April. Both Jeevan and I own several rental properties, which is wonderful. Have I sold a few? Absolutely. Have I regretted selling a few? Yeah, I definitely wish I had kept a few of them, but I needed the money from the first step to get to the second step and the money from the second step in some cases to get to the third step because I needed the money to do other things. So is there a valid reason to sell? Yeah, however, it's not for vacations and sports cars and the like. It is for bigger picture items, like I mentioned. So could we sell real estate personally? Yes, but the objective is to keep it as long as you can so that it becomes a generational gift to your children, or at least um, a stepping stone for them to get to the next step of their life. Uh, number six, real estate is a long-term investment. And this just a, a segue in from the previous point you know that long-term you wanna be successful. You know that you wanna have a nest egg. Real estate could fluctuate in the next one to two, three years. Doubtful, but it could even correct. Extremely doubtful, but it is possible. My opinion is real estate is a long-term scenario. To me, long-term in my life is 10 years out. So everything from 10 years out. If you think you're gonna move and leave the GTA of Toronto in the next two to three years, buying real estate may be still a good uh, avenue for you but you'd also have to understand that you may have to sell in two years in a down cycle because of unforeseen factors that are out of your control. So short-term, maybe still a good investment. Long-term, for sure, it's a good investment and it's definitely something you wanna look at. It's somewhere that you wanna have your money in the long-term because it just keeps going up while you're not doing anything other than maybe answering a few phone calls from your tenants. Uh, number seven, real estate flips. This one, I have a strong opinion on. I'm not into real estate flips. I don't help clients do real estate flips. I'm not a believer of real estate flips. There are programs on TV that will encourage you to buy low, renovate, sell it high, and make a small profit and move on. I emphasize the word small profit. I did flips in my career. I thought I was so smart. I was buying them for 200,000. I was putting 50,000 in and I was selling them for 300,000. And after all my lawyer's fees and costs and stuff, I made 20 grand, let's say hypothetically on that property. And I thought I was so smart. I knew everything. 20 grand is nothing. 20 grand is nothing. Cause that property right now is now 700,000. And I could have made three or 400,000 more just by keeping it, putting a tenant in there, collecting rent and doing some odd updates to the home, maybe a new roof, maybe you know a new furnace, uh, maybe a few other things. How smart I thought I was. I'm not into flips. I don't recommend them. Yeah, television has made them look sexy and desirable. That is not the theory that I have. It's not what I share. Um, if you wanna go that route, that's fine. I'll help you buy a home. I'll help you sell the home. But I can tell you right up front, you'll be wealthier if you go with the equation that I put on there, which is buy, hold, prosper. Buy the property, pay fair value, renovate it if necessary, rent it out to good tenants, hold, keep it, make it a generational thing. That is that you're not planning to sell it. And as it goes up in value, you can refinance it. And again, Jeevan would, can help you with this. So if the property doubles in value in the next 10 years, which would be a very realistic expectation, it may double in five years, but let's just say it doubles in 10 years. So you paid 300,000 for it and it's now worth 600. You can refinance it and take out 150 or 200,000 of that profit and use that to live on, to reinvest, to 
give money to your children maybe to help them through university or whatever it is. So again, buy, hold, prosper. No flips, please. I don't recommend them. And again, other people may have uh, questions on this, but again, I don't believe in it. And again, when you sell the property, as I just saw on the screen there, you're going to be paying tax. If it's a rental property, you'll be paying capital gains tax and maybe a lot of tax, depending on how much it goes up. So buy, hold, prosper. Uh, point number eight, like investing in the stock market, don't try to do it on your own. The stock market is a very cruel, vicious animal. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to lose big time. <laughs> the biggest thing that can go wrong in the stock market, and I joke about this because uh, this person learned all about the stock market, thought I knew something that no one else knew, thought I was smarter than everybody else, thought I knew a, a lead or a, an angle on a stock that I could outsmart everybody else. No, no, I was, I outsmarted myself is all I did. You need help. You need professional advice. So just like investing, which is what Eric and Jeff and Watchmans can help you with, you need help with the real estate. You need someone that can guide you, maybe pre-approve you like a Jeevan that can get you uh, in, in, into the market financially and in the mindset. And then a person like myself who can take you out and show you the properties. Both functions are extremely important. You need professional advice and guidance. Is it possible you won't agree with my advice? That totally, totally, then that's fine. I'm okay with that, but I'll tell you the truth as will Jeevan, we'll give you our best advice based on our experience. And again, if I had to do it over again, I would have never touched the stock market personally. I would have left it to a financial planner and followed his or her advice and I would have followed my real estate agent's advice that I had pre previous to me becoming a real estate agent who said, hold the property. And I said, no, 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 I'm going to do some flips. I think I can do this. I have an engineering background. I've got some renovators. I know I could make 10 grand, 20 grand, 50 grand quickly on this one to move on. Yeah, well, <laughs> again, as I said earlier, that property is now quadrupled in the last 25 years. And who's laughing now? <laughs> the new owner who bought it <laughs> is extremely happy. And I'm looking going, hmm. That's not leaving a very good taste in my mouth. Steven, you want to add something in there? I think you're muted there. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, you know, as a matter of the advice that Sandy just gave you about buying, holding, and prospering, um, it's accurate. You know, as a matter of dealing with professionals, I tried trading stocks on my own and I turned $5,000 into three hundred. dollars uh, that's not 300,000, that's $300. So I've got a little bit of a tax write-off, but it's just proof that you don't know what you don't know, right? A lot of times people just like, you know, do you find this, Sandy? It's it's like when somebody has a car problem and everybody's got an answer, or, you know, if you're not feeling well and everybody knows what's wrong with you and you take every. You need your wisdom. Maybe even who your internet provider is, right, Jeevan? <laughs> Everybody's opinion. If anybody can give them a one star, I'd appreciate it. I've left them a couple. It hasn't changed anything. Um, but what I was saying is, is that, you know, dealing with a professional is what it's all about, and especially when you're buying. Like Sandy doesn't charge you. In normal cases, I charge you nothing for my services. I'm paid by the bank. Uh, I do accept tips. I say that as a joke. Uh, but realistically, you know, we're here. We only succeed when you succeed. You know, we only get our de next deal when we've made a, a great deal happen for you. Um, while we were in this conference, I got a call from somebody and I had to mute because you know what? We did a deal for friends of theirs in April and they really appreciated the advice. And guess what? Now their friend they're you know, they referred us onwards. Did I send them, you know, a gift card? No. Did I send them a coffee? No. All I did is give them honest advice. Um, and it's unfortunate that it, it, it comes few and far between nowadays. Yeah, you know, great points. And again, and just to, if for those who don't know, again, Jeevan had just indicated he doesn't get paid uh, by, by the buyer up front for getting you a mortgage. Me, the real estate agent, I don't get paid by you either, you being the buyer. I get paid by the seller of the home. So for a buyer coming in for the first time, Jeevan services are free, essentially, because Jeevan will be paid by the lending institution, a finder's fee. I, Sandy Kennedy, the real estate agent, will be paid by the seller of the home, not you, the buyer. So it's essentially free service to both of you when you're on the when you're buying, when you're selling, 
slightly different, but uh, on the buying end, no fees up front to Sandy Kennedy, no contract up front with Sandy Kennedy. You work with me if you like me. If you don't like me, you move on to someone else. Hopefully that's not the case. But what I'm saying is you're not locked into a contract with Sandy Kennedy. Same with Jeevan. He will give you a quote, I'm sure. And, and if you feel comfortable, you go ahead with him. If you don't, then that's okay too. You can get a second opinion from someone else. And, and this would be a point that I have, which is not on our charts here, is that you have to feel comfortable with who's on your team. And the mortgage broker is an extremely important part of that. And your real estate agent is equally important. And if you don't like those two team members, you probably should be looking for a different team member. And that's unfortunate. I would be disappointed if that's the case, but if that is the case and acknowledge it, move on and, and hopefully have a happy result. Uh, point number nine, if we can get back to our points here, as I said, we're over time here, so I'm sorry, I'm trying to that's keep it on schedule here. We, Jeevan already covered this, get a pre-approved uh, mortgage with your bank or your broker. I recommend working with a broker like Jeevan. The reason for that is, and I think he explained this earlier, is he can source your funds from any one of 30, 40 different lending institutions. And at any given time, one bank, let's pick on Bank of Nova Scotia, for example, which is who I bank with, may or may not be receptive to adding new people to their portfolio right now. Maybe this week, TD Bank wants more mortgage money out there, and they're probably going to be a little looser on their rules and their pre-approval process this week because they have some money that they want to get out in circulation. Whereas next week, it could be totally reversed. Jeevan would know this. He would know where you're best app to find your best source of funds at this time, given the market we're in. He can do one app with you, one application, and then farm it around or shop it out to many lending institutions and get you an answer that's satisfactory. He can get you the best rate with one application. Whereas if you try and do it on your own, oh, I've dealt with Bank of Nova Scotia. I know them. I have a good relationship or TD or CIBC, all of good lending institutions. But that you do it on your own, you may have to go around to 10 different lending institutions, do 10 different applications, 10 different credit checks, 10 different employment letters. That is not going to be fun or positive. Chiban. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to say is, is that for a lot of these major banks, they've actually changed the way that they underwrite. So if you, say you have a parent participating in your deal as a co-signer, and they've got a $100,000 line of credit that they owe nothing on. You know, to them, they have no debt. To a lot of the institutions, including the ones you just mentioned, Sandy, they will do their analysis like your family owes that full 100000 like you've used 100% of that available credit. What does that mean? Literally, it means that you'll qualify for about $200,000 less than you would have if that was excluded based on the fact that it has a zero balance. So these are the things that are the nuances because I drive the bus every day. So as a matter of shopping your deal to 30 lenders, no, I'm not gonna do that because the first thing I did when I woke up this morning was to check the rate band across all the lenders. It's my job, it's my product knowledge. It's If I don't have that in my pocket, what am I even doing? Because I, I'm definitely not answering questions accurately. You know, honesty and transparency and information is huge. Um, a lot of people, you know, Sandy made a very poignant comment on how he does not restrict buyers into a contract before they purchase. You know who does that, guys? You know who does that? It's people like me and Sandy, because we know that the value we're going to bring to the table should put you in a position where you want to transact with us. If you're one of those few people per year that is using us to tap our mind and then, you know, taking it to your cousin that just got their real estate license, then, hey, more power to you. That's your karma. Um, but the point is, is that when you're dealing with us, there has to be an inherent level of trust. Right. That's why even for my company, when I started it, people were like, why are you joining the Better Business Bureau? And I'm like, well, how do I tell strangers I'm trustworthy? Right. How, how can I get that point across without saying that sleazy line of, oh, you can trust me. I can even lower my voice a couple octaves when I say it. It doesn't make it any more honest. Uh, it's, it's experience. It's a track record. It's, it's doing deals for people over and over again and having them trust you. It's having, you know what, Sandy, one of the biggest compliments that you and I are going to get today is the people that invited us to this, to this actual thing. And this is not a plant. I am not here to pump the Walkman and Homer tires, but these are people that are professionals that recognize other professionals and defer to us. Just like I will tell you, go talk to Pear or Eric or Jeff if you're thinking about investments, if you're thinking about how to grow your money. And you know, truth be told, I'm trying to find a way to marry my business to these guys. And it's because 
of how transparent and straight up they are. Shady is not the name of the game. Right. And so many people try and get us with smoke and mirrors and make it seem like, you know, what they're doing is rocket science for you. No, mortgage brokering and real estate are not rocket science. Uh, while there's a recipe to be followed for success, it is definitely not rocket science. It's not medicine. We get paid very well to help people achieve their goals. And that's that. Sorry, yeah. I'll go back. Excellent. to you. Thank you, Jeevan. Very good. And I'm just going to end off with point number 10 there, Eric, if you could put that up on there we go. Call Sandy and start packing. <laughs> Been my tagline for 32 years now. Uh, again, my cell phone number for anybody listening out there that wants to text me or call me directly, 416-230-1700. Thank you very much for your attention and happy to accept any questions from anybody watching or listening. Thank you. Wonderful. And, and I'll just remind everybody, you can expect uh, either end of day today or in, in a few days, we'll have a summary, a one pager with uh, our top tips. Uh, and then we'll have everybody's contact information on email here. So if you didn't get a chance to jot uh, the, the cell phones down, you'll have that all there. And if you do have a question, just check your email, click a link, send away. I mean, that, that, that's the whole goal of today's presentation for one to inform, to empower you. Uh, we want you to, to do your homework. And then if you're ready, if this is right for you, then we want to plug you in with the, the specialists and the experts that can help you do so. That's the name of the game in life is, is figuring out who are the specialists and who you can work for, with and who you like working with. Uh, hopefully we presented a few today um, from experience. They're, they're both wonderful people and they have your best interests at heart. So happy to share that with you and happy to, uh, very happy to have Sandy on his birthday and, uh, and even taking part in today's call. So a big, uh, big heartfelt thank you to both of you for taking the time today. Any questions from the viewers out there, may I ask, uh, at this point? Uh, nothing else coming in. We've answered the ones that were in the queue. The only other one was with regards to the bidding process. And maybe if you want to end on that note, uh, if, if the bidding process for homes is, has changed at all and where you see that, and then we'll end on that note, Sandy. And yeah, uh, the, the bidding process is a very stressful situation for a lot of buyers. Uh, again, going back to the scenario I described earlier, you find your dream home, you put an offer in, then you get the unfortunate call. There are 27 other offers and you have to submit your best offer up front. And then the question is, well, how much are the other offers? Oh, I can't tell you how much the other offers are. That's, that's unethical in our industry. We're not allowed to do that. So there is a considerable amount of discussion happening at the upper levels of government right now of making that transparent, which most of us agents and even from a mortgage broker's point of view would like make it transparent, kind of like what you see on eBay or in a virtual auction. Someone else bids more than you, you can see what they bid. And then you have a few minutes or maybe more time to match that bid or exceed the bid. Um, transparency, I think, is the way to go in life. And that's the way our industries are going. That's the way society is going. And I think our industry needs a makeover. But unfortunately, that's at the provincial level. And uh, obviously not something I can do, but we at the working level would love to have a transparent process. And so that the buyer, the buyer who loses out, at least acknowledged up front, I had a chance to go higher. I chose not to because I didn't see the value. I know why I lost it because the other person paid more, but at least I was given that choice and made a conscious decision before losing it. Right now, Again, in the current process, you throw your offer in. Again, let's go back to the property that's that's five ninety nine. You offer seven hundred, which is one hundred and one thousand dollars over full price, and you don't get it. You're going to be upset. You're going to go, man, Sandy. I, I offered one hundred thousand over. What what the heck? What gives? Well, someone offered one hundred and twenty more. Well, Sandy, if I had known that upfront, I may have revised my bid and offered one hundred and thirty more. Well, that would have helped the seller, and the seller is the one that you know, is, is getting the money at the end of the day. And our job is to help the seller if we're on the seller side. So a transparent bidding process would be welcomed from my personal point of view, but I'm one member of many. And uh, Jeevan, I think you welcome that idea. But again, we are just one voice in a crowded marketplace. Correct, Jeevan? Yeah, absolutely. You know, transparency in the offer process would change this industry overnight. Um, and the reason I believe it would do so is, is just exactly as you said, Sandy, you know, if I'm willing, if this is the house for me, allow me the opportunity to, to bid against whoever feels the house is for them. Right. So there's plenty of situations where, you know, you hear of people losing out by a couple thousand bucks or, you know, somebody used a round number and somebody else added 1K to make it an odd number. 
you know, when I'm hearing the strategies that a lot of realtors are using to try and win the bidding process, you know, letters from the family, photos of the family, yeah. you know, uh, you know and, and in some cases that works, right? But the point is, is that the professional you're working with is the one that needs to help you establish your strategy. And if you're dealing with somebody that's uh, not a veteran of the industry, you know, the reason that you want to deal with those people is because they've done it before right? Like you're not going to go to a swim instructor that's never learned to swim. Like it just, for me, and I totally get it because when I was getting into this industry, people were like, oh, well, you know, uh, it's going to be tough for you to compete with the guys that have been around for 10, 15 years. And I laughed at them uh, because I was like, well, you obviously haven't met me. But the point is, is that you know, a lot of people, you know, Sandy, how many times do you hear from people that they're just going to take a step back because they, you know, they feel like they're being overwhelmed. Whoever thought that mental health, and I'm, and I'm not saying this because Bell Let's Talk today is Thursday, but who would have thought that mental health could be affected by the home buying process? Debt, I understand. Mortgages, ballooning out of control, debt levels ballooning out of control, affecting mental health. I totally understand. But for people to cower and move out of the market because they're so discouraged by the fact that they have not been able to win a bid are people that are not being led correctly. And, and the reason I say that is, is that it is our job as professionals to manage your expectations so you understand the range of what can be achieved for you. Uh, the people that will throw anything against the wall to see if it'll stick or recommend that you do unscrupulous things to qualify for more than you should qualify for today. Those rules are there for a reason. You know, we never really even touched on fraud and inflation of numbers in today's presentation. The amount of people that I'll meet, um, I had a just in very quickly, because I know everybody's got a life. I had a realtor sent to me by the president, the owner of the of the real estate company that they worked for and told me that there was an issue with the appraisal of the property. So having done a bit of math quickly, I was like, okay, I can get you past all of this. No problem. And then he dropped a line on me and he said, well, okay, but just to let you know, these people are looking for a full package. And I went, okay, so yeah, don't worry. We have wicked partners that sell insurance and we'll be happy to put them in touch with them. And the guy on the phone goes, no, that's not what I meant. And I'm like, oh, like, do you mean home insurance? He's like, no. I'm like, do you mean line of credit? Like, talk to me here. He's like, no, I mean that they'll need somebody to falsify the income information for them, for them to buy this home. And I said to him, I'm like, dude, I'm like, do you know who sent you to me? The owner of your company. I'm like, and you're having this conversation with me like it's nothing? I'm like, we don't do this. I'm like, and I'm really sorry, but the owner of the real estate you, company you work for is a per. Jamie, you might be back or if not in the conversation moving forward. And I didn't have the client names and, you know, I'm not, uh, somebody that's out there to change the world, but you got to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point, Chief. And thank you very much. No, that's great. And on that note, I mean, we're all, all three of us are, are there to be in your corner and to, uh, to fight those bouts and to, to be sure that you're putting your best foot forward. So uh, on that, a huge thank you to everybody for participating, for sharing your lunch hour with you. Uh, and then some, so we hope uh, you, you gained some knowledge. There was so much information that was shared. So please, if you have any questions at any point, uh, we'll be sending that email out shortly. Please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. Uh, no, no question too small. So again, big thank you to everybody participating and our speakers and uh, wishing everybody a nice rest of this uh, snowy day. It's still coming down here in the GTA. So at least we get a little change of scenery outside. So thanks to everybody. Stay well, stay healthy. Thank you for your time, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Happy Take birthday, care. Sandy. <laughs> Thank you. Celebration. Bye-bye. Thanks. See you, guys. Happy yeah. birthday, Sandy. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good one, guys. Have a good day. Stay safe. Enjoy Stay the nice. snow. <laughs>